Social media are good at telling us what is supposedly going on, but not necessarily why. We'll talk about the ramifications of that next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. How do you stay current on what's happening in the world? The morning paper and nightly news have been joined by online wire services, opinion blogs, and even up-to-the-minute tweets. While the way people get their news continues to change, the importance of opinion journalists who help to frame the key issues remains the same. It is easy to get lost in this abundance of information. Opinion journalists find ways to provide the context. Today's guest, Brahma Harrop, is a nationally syndicated columnist whose work appears in over 150 publications. And, as president of the Association of Opinion Journalists, Harrop is an advocate for high standards among opinion writers and editors. Hello, Froma. Welcome to the show. Thanks, John, for inviting me. Now, you recently appeared on The Daily Show. How did that happen, and what was the experience <laughs> like? You're still <laughs> laughing. I'm still <laughs> laughing. Indeed, I did. Uh, what happened was about 15 months ago, uh, uh, the president of my organization, the Association of Opinion Jur Journalists, resigned, and as vice president, I was suddenly thrust into the president's chair. Uh, meanwhile, people elsewhere in the organization were starting something they were calling the Civility Project. Uh, now, come summer, I wrote a column in which I um, called the uh, Tea Party people. This was during the uh, debt ceiling debate. Uh, economic terrorists, and uh, the Wall Street Journal picked up on that. Uh, they had called them hobbits, so I think they were trying to deflect some of the anger elsewhere. And so they, they ran a whole bunch of blog entries um, uh, saying that I was president of a group running a thing called the Civility Project while calling uh, uh, Tea Party people economic terrorists, and that, that was somehow a, a conflict. Uh, the Daily Show picked up on it. Next thing I know, they're, they're ribbing me over, over what seemed to be a contradiction. I don't think it was, and we could go into that sometime, but uh, that's how I got on. No, they don't understand it. I said a lot of people don't. Yeah, they just don't get irony. The experience was sort of fun, but uh, it is a lot of people misinterpreted what was going on, but it, it was a comedy show, so. And I'm sure a lot of people misinterpret what you say and your opinions and in, in your columns, uh, f probably uh, with regularity. But, but tell us about some of your more interesting and controversial subjects. This surely wasn't the only one that drew attention. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting what draws controversy. If I write about, I write about everything. If I write about cars, SUVs, or or fuel efficiency, that arouses a lot of anger. That pushes a lot of buttons, and it always uh, uh, intrigues me that that's what happens when I write about cars. Writing about politics now, um, I just had a column talking about the Tea Party people again, uh, and I, my mailbox has just been overflowing with, with mostly unhappy comment. But other than the Tea Party, what, what would be some subjects that are fun for you that you enjoy writing about? Well, fun for me, oddly enough, I enjoy writing about finance. Uh, my training was as a business journalist. I wrote a column recently about LIBOR. And, and it was fun when you study what's going on in, in, in the world of finance and how outrageous so much of it is. Uh, so it's fun for me to write about that uh, such columns, however, require a lot of explanation because few ordinary readers really know what LIBOR is, and so I have to explain why it's important. Are there any issues that you don't have to explain as much that you think resonate with, with your audience? Well, you don't have to explain things that have to do with sex. I think 
that's one reason why Monica Lewinsky became such a big story, because everyone could understand it pretty easily. Things having to do with Hollywood stars. I sometimes write about uh, you know, their mores and, and things that they promote and that the culture picks up on. And everyone understands that. And those are easy columns to write. They're also fun because I don't have to grapple with uh, uh, deep, deep policy matters. And there was a, an incident recently, a uh, bit of an outcry regarding Sally Ride and her oh, preferences yes. expressed after her death. Yes. I didn't write about that because people being gay or not gay is, is so much a non-issue for me and actually for most young people too. My feeling on this subject is that people who want to remain in the closet as Sally Ride did should decide whether they do so. Uh, if that person should, should die and, and obituary writers want to present their full life story, then these things do have to be mentioned. It's uh, become a very tense and difficult territory uh, uh, distinguishing between what's private and what's public now. Um, and it's going to get worse as time goes on because everything's out on the internet these days. Well, and that's the issue, I guess. Some have said because of the new media, uh, it's the end of privacy. Is, do you agree with that or do you still think there are some areas we can attempt to protect? I think it's the end of privacy for anyone who isn't careful about protecting it. Uh, if you want to protect your privacy, there are means you can take. Don't say anything on Facebook. Uh, if, you're, if you're in the public eye and, and you have news people and camera people following you, don't do anything that you don't want to be reported on. No one is going to protect you anymore. Uh, but one can protect oneself somewhat. And uh, actually the Obamas have done a pretty good job of protecting their children. Their children don't get in the news much at all. And so there, there are some things you can do. Uh, but if you're a, a lesbian out, out with your date uh, you know, at, at the Applebee's, then forget about it. It's not private anymore. What about the journalists themselves? Um, we, we depend on opinion journalists to be honest and straightforward yeah. and so forth, and yet from time to time we find that that's not the case. Uh, there are weaknesses just as there are in the general population and yeah. people mis misrepresent. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that broadly? You mean people talking about our private lives, which they do? Well, yeah. that, but, but also journalists talking about things that maybe are not correct or are exaggerated or may, maybe the entire image you're presenting is, is a fiction. Oh, well, uh, we there are many different kinds of people out there who call themselves journalists, and some of them don't care. They don't feel they have to correct their errors. They don't, uh, they don't you know, what they say, they, they um, spit out in their blogs or sometimes on the air, and that's it, and, and it's over as far as they're concerned. There's no record to correct. Um, there was an interesting uh, incident recently, however, uh, during the upheavals in Syria, uh, there was a, a very rather powerful blog called Gay Girl in D Damascus. Mm -hmm. And it was purportedly written by a gay girl in Damascus, and it was writing about the gay community there, uh, plus what was happening on the streets. And because so, m so many of the uh, mainstream, I don't like to call them mainstream, professional media, mm -hmm. Uh, no longer have bureaus, they no longer have a lot of people in these countries, they've come to rely on social media uh, for their information. And so major league uh, newspapers were quoting Gay Girl in Damascus as an authoritative source on what was going on there. Right. It turns out that the Gay Girl in Damascus was a married American man uh, living in Scotland. It was completely fiction made up in his kitchen. And here we had internationally renowned media quoting from it as, a, as, a, as an authoritative source. Uh, we see similar things now uh, uh, when, when something dramatic happens, uh, say in Egypt, there, there are a lot of people out on the street and CNN is reporting on tweets they're getting 
from people purportedly in, in Cairo, plus film footage, none of it can be confirmed as accurate. And they put it up because that's the only information they have. And they do, uh, to protect themselves, say, well, we have to say these are unconfirmed reports. Uh, however, very often they're the only reports out there. So all these millions and millions of people all over the world checking, say, CNN for what's going on, think, well, this is what's going on. This is the best information we have. And that's how they process it. Some people who are very sophisticated may say, hmm, I wonder whether this is true or not, but I bet most people don't. Mm -hmm. Do you use Twitter for information? Uh, no, I don't. So you, you pay attention to it, but you don't? Yes. I have a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. I follow people on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't use it for information for reasons I pretty much just stated. Mm -hmm. And I'm a columnist, so I have the... Um, the luxury of thinking about what I'm going to write, reading, reading up on things. Um, I don't have to spit something out in, in the next 10 minutes or, or the competition beats me. So there are things I do see on social media that pique my interest and sometimes they're, they're anonymous, they're not attached, they're unconfirmed. And what I think a good journalist does when that happens and they want to follow up is they try to confirm it through other sources. Now, you, you touched on this a bit when you mentioned how news organizations have mostly pulled their bureaus out of locations yeah. around the world. And, and, and this raises a very serious question. We are in an era, clearly, in which access to information is more important than ever, especially when it comes to events developing in other countries that may have an effect on us, and yet our ability to gather information on those types of, yeah. of activities is, is very much limited by the fact that our news organizations often aren't there anymore. Yes. Tell us what you think is the role of international in terms of news coverage generally and then in the opinion writing area specifically. Well, I found that it's getting harder and harder to separate international news from domestic news, uh, partly because of, uh, of immigration flows of people, uh, globalization, uh, our trading relationships. Uh, if, uh, you know, if, for example, uh, Apple has a problem with its patents in China, that is a story for all of us. And, and so that's no longer a story over there. It's, it's a story that is really part of America's story too. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think there's a great distinction between these two kinds of reporting that there used to be. There seems to have been a, a marked decline in the relative percentage of international news compared to what we had 10, 20 years ago. And, um, at the same time, with what you just described, this globalization phenomenon has really created an incredibly mm. shrinking, interdependent world, and therefore the importance of understanding these developments elsewhere is greater than ever. I think there are a number of sources that cover the waterfront, that cover the world, uh, say BBC, Reuters, the New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal to some extent, uh, and they are still good, reliable sources of what's going on in The Economist magazine. Um, even some of the financial services, uh, such as Bloomberg. One of the problems, though, is, is to get, it, get some of these stories on the, on the front page of a newspaper or the front page of a, of a website. Because it's really hard to get a lot of Americans interested in, in uh, foreign affairs uh, if the strong connection to their lives is not made. Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked about this before in terms of the, the human trafficking issue. This is an issue that has really, really come into focus in the past decade for many people. And yet, oftentimes, the, the victims seem to be yeah. individuals from other places. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard for us to relate. Yeah. But now we're seeing more and more victims who look like our neighbors. Uh, growing up, and, and so that really brings the issue home. And there's more telling of their stories. Even the non-news media, as I pointed out, they had uh, Law & Order had an episode 
on, on trafficking from China. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese girls who had been delivered into New York to be uh, sent to brothels. I think telling their stories is really a helpful way to bring the issue to, to the public. Mm -hmm. And we're also talking to a public that is, whose attention is really distracted in a million different, uh, there are 500 channels, there are six, six or 10 movie channels alone, video games, this or that, plus everyone is working second shifts and trying to raise children and work at the same time. So, so, we ha so the job has gotten harder uh, to focus attention on, on some of the important issues, uh, and that goes doubly for international issues. But what else do you do, you and other opinion journalists, if you want information mm -hmm. on international issues from a governmental, U.S. governmental perspective or yeah. some other perspective, do you aggressively seek that out? Do you proactively in, engage those institutions to make sure you're getting the right information? Yes, I do. And in fact, uh, the Associate of Opinion Journalists, uh, every spring we have what's called the State Department Briefing, uh, in which the State Department brings, brings together experts uh, from various parts of the world, we bring our journalists who come from some of the biggest papers in the country and some of the smallest in the country to, to a, a day-long seminar there in which we get a, get a chance to talk to these people. And um, I remember asking uh, the head of, I don't know, the public relations at the State Department, I said, suppose we want to know what the official view is. How do we find out? He said, call me. And he handed out his card, and so we have his card, and and so a, a good journalist can call the State Department for the official American view. Mm -hmm. And I repeat, it is the official view. It's and 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 that has been massaged in certain ways. Now, in this State Department setting, you would get information from people who might be outside of the public view, but you'd also get information from people who are very prominent. Two years ago, Hillary Clinton dropped by. Uh, this, it, it happened that our briefing was taking place the morning after um, Os Osama bin Laden had been killed, and so Clinton was all over the State Department, uh, and she stopped by to talk to us, which was lucky and, and very interesting at the same time. Now, you would ordinarily hope that she would come to these, yes. but this was one time you probably thought she wasn't showing up. In the past, most, most secretaries of state do attend our briefing. Uh, in the last few years, they haven't, uh, but two years ago was an exception when, when uh, Clinton came. But we do talk to, uh, we, we, we talk to Holbrook. I mean, we, we talk to rather high officials in the State Department. Uh, and, and that's very helpful for us, uh, not only in, in terms of alerting us to things to write about and telling us where to find more information on it, but, um, but getting us going on, on writing on these subjects as opposed to the 20,000 other subjects we have, uh, especially in this political year, uh, that take up our time. What is the importance of international content in opinion journalism. Uh, obviously, you, you, you write about this from time to time. And in a political season with foreign policy being a key aspect of the campaigns, yes. I would think that these issues would, would have an even higher profile or should have a higher profile. I think high profile issues have high profiles. For example, uh, Iran's uh, uh, seeking nuclear weapons. That is an emotional big issue, and, and so what the candidates think about that is very important in this campaign. Also, trade issues remain salient. Uh, some, of, some of the issues involving smaller matters, say, uh, well, they're not small matters, but they're small to the general public, say, uh, intellectual property rights and that kind of thing, they don't get a lot of play in, in the national elections. Sadly, but that's the reality. What are some of your most interesting, you know, when, you, when you venture into an international subject area, what, what do you like to write about? I like to write about trade, and some of this goes back to my background as a business writer. 
I wrote about the gay girl in D Damascus uh, as the story was really about anonymity on the internet and, and, and how so many people are using anonymous sources as, as good information. And my point here is, is that's especially serious problem when it comes to international reporting. So in a way, social media and the development of it has become very important in international reporting. What, what are some topics you're thinking about that could be featured in, in future columns, if we can talk about that without giving away sure. any secrets, um, especially international issues, but, but national ones too? Well, internationally, uh, we were discussing uh, trafficking, human trafficking. I think that's a fascinating subject that hasn't gotten enough coverage. Uh, other international issues, I think uh, I'm, I'm planning to write something else on, on the problems in Europe, the, uh, uh, what's happening in Spain, and, and each country there is having its own problems. We, we, we sort of lump them together as, as certain countries in Europe, uh, the so-called pigs, Portugal, Ireland, um, Greece, and Spain being the problem areas. Uh, but each one of those countries really have a different um, economic crisis going on. And to, to those, we can now add Italy. So these are very big stories, and I intend to write about them. What about domestic, other than okay. the elections and uh, national yeah. political issues? What, what uh, inspires you? Well, uh, I am interested in... Um, and nowadays everything has a political component. I am interested in, in what's happening, say, to unions, uh, public service unions especially, um, how, how the changes in so many teachers' contracts um, is going to affect edu the kind of education we have in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. Uh, I have a column uh, coming out on on uh, mega mansions. Uh, this is one of my social commentary columns, but I just, I was just reading the children's book, Wind in the Willows, where, uh, where all the little animals love to cuddle in Badger Cottage, uh, as opposed to Toad Hall, where Mr. Toad lives. And uh, Mark Hampton, who is, who is the late Mark Hampton, a great interior decorator, decorator to, uh, to the aristocracy, used to write about how people really would rather live in small spaces than in Toad Hall. Mm -hmm. And so I found some articles in the Wall Street Journal about the revival of, of these uh, 40,000, 50,000 foot houses, houses with bowling alleys in their basement, with theaters, with ballrooms, uh, with uh, showrooms for, the, for antique car collections. and and also what it's like to build houses like that, because they say when they have to build houses like that, it's not like doing a residential project, it's like doing an office park. They have to think about uh, exotic security systems, having uh, little go-karts that people can go from one end of the property to the other, and so that's the sort of thing I write, write about also. Good. Well, thank you for joining us today from Mahara. It's been a pleasure, John. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Garcia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF.